How you doing? It's your pal Mike Squires, and this is the Couchers Podcast, episode number 275. My guest this episode is Stephen Chopek. Stephen is primarily known as a drummer. He has recently toured with Mike Doty, who's a Couch Riffs alumni, podcast alumni. He also has drummed for a couple of uh, relatively well-known guitar players named Charlie Hunter and John Mayer. Pretty good gigs, pretty good guitar players. Stephen is a multi-instrumentalist, has been recording his own uh, songwriting and recording his own music, mixing everything at home in his home studio. He's released a number of singles and EPs. He recently released a cover of the Pogues' Five Green Queens and Jean. I hope I don't screw that up. I don't know the Pogues' music. And I, I was like, I'm going to do this without writing anything down. He's released one EP, Songs of Shane, Volume 1. He's about to release uh, Volume 2 in uh, late April. And... Um, uh, what a talented guy. He recently was on the For My Lover playing drums and percussion and a hell of a nice guy. And we have some social crossover, which is great. We, the, some that I was aware of and some that I wasn't aware of. So a couple of friends uh, get shout outs in this episode, Nabil Ayers and Aaron Malasco. Some, you know, folks that we both know uh, that I know from Seattle. Neither of them are in Seattle anymore, but I had a great time hanging with Steven. Do go check out his music. It's great. If you need a killer drummer for your band, hit him up. He's ready to tour. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Uh, if you are enjoying the Couch Riffs podcast, please, by all means, this is my personal invitation to you to support us on Patreon. Patreon is the only place where you can download the audio for the cover songs that Couch Riffs makes. They're not available streaming or for purchase anywhere. And your support is what makes this podcast and those cover songs happen. I have big ideas about what Couch Riffs can be and can do, but it can't happen without Patreon. So everything that has happened so far is because of Patreon. So if you are already supporting, thank you so much. If you are not supporting and you're considering it, please do. Please go get on over there. What are you waiting for? Thank you. I'd also like to thank Variety Coffee Roasters. I'm drinking some Variety Coffee right now. I uh, saw my friends at Variety Coffee Roasters just yesterday at the roastery. Variety is a coffee roaster in Brooklyn, New York. They have a number of cafes in Brooklyn and Manhattan. It's killer. They're about to release their uh, Blendless Summer limited uh, limited blend of coffee for the especially for the summer. I got to be a be a small part of their little think tank over there for the packaging neato packaging they have a subscription service if you are not in brooklyn and you don't have the means to pick up their coffee go to their website varietycoffeeroasters.com subscribe it's easy you click a couple buttons and they just send it to you you never run out of coffee it's great i drink it every single morning i don't know what else to tell you about it drink it it's fucking delicious thank you variety i also want to thank shane middleton Shane's got The Cut by Shane. I fucked that up. You know that? I fucked it up. I got my hairs cut off, my my COVID hair cut off when I was on tour in LA. Um, and I had been wanting to get a haircut from Shane for a long time. Finally got me one. I'm going to get another one when I'm there rehearsing for tour uh, at the end of April. Hopefully I got to make an appointment maybe. Shane also has uh, The Middleton Hair Company. I've got a hat on right now, but I, you know, I've been using his hair care products since that day I got my hair cut. I started just using the Motion Lotion, which is like a moisturizer, uh, con hair leave-in conditioner kind of a thing. If you just want to give your hair a little weight after you wash it. And um, the holding paste, I was using that. And now I'm using the shampoo and the conditioner. And it's great. It smells great. I don't have to use my wife's products and feel like I smell too pretty. I mean, look at me. I don't need to be smelling pretty. I don't even look like I smell pretty. And uh, it's I, I love it. I use it every day. So again, I don't know what a better endorsement to give you. Check out Middleton Hair Company. And go get your hair cut, cut by Shane. It's right there in the Hollywood. Thank you, Shane. You guys, we're going to get into the episode. Thank you for sticking in through this intro with me. Don't forget the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And don't be a dick. That's the that's the gag. That's the joke that I lead every single episode with. 
That gets him smiling. Yeah. Um, Stephen, welcome to the Couchers podcast. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. I, I want to. St- I want to start off like right off the bat with something familiar to both of us, and that is, I saw you post a picture of yourself with Nabil Ayers. Yep. And the photo implied that you guys toured together. We did. And so, so tell me about that because I was in. I've been in a couple bands with Nabil. Were you in Alien Crime Syndicate? I was, but I didn't do the Tommy Stinson tour. Okay, that that's how I know Nabil. When um, I used to play drums with Jesse Mallon on okay. his his second record called The Heat. Uh, I toured with him on that in from 2004 to 2005. We did a bunch of stuff in the U.S. and in the over in the U.K. We did a bunch of dates, and um, we also so at the time. To- so Tommy, I think Jesse and Tommy have known each other for a while, and at the time they were both being managed by Diane Gentile, and Tommy had just come out with uh, Village Gorilla Head. Yeah, Gorilla Village Head. I think Village Gorilla Head. Um, he had just come out with that record. So he was touring for that and he had been, so his backup band at the time, I think right before that or right after that, he's been playing with the figs for a while, you know, like the figs were his kind of backup band. And, um, so, you know, they would like, so they would go on tour and, and the figs would open and then the figs would be Tommy's backing band. So on this tour, um, his band was alien crime syndicate. Right. Uh, from from Seattle, and I'm not sure how they linked up, how they knew each other, but so Alien they knew Crime each other get... through Joe, the singer. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and Nabil was still in Seattle at the time, so that's how we knew each other. So we did a bunch of, we did a couple of shows, and we may, I don't even know actually if we did any shows in the U.S., but we were definitely in the U.K. and we did a bunch of shows over there. Um, and it was fun, man. We were all, uh, you know, we were all on the same double decker bus, and yeah. um, that was the first time I had met. Uh, that first time I had met Tommy, and I'd, I'd, I'd been a, you know, replace replacements fan for a long time. Sure. So that was like uh, that was a real um, test in like being cool. You know, don't be like you know, just be cool Tell around me Tommy about Stinson. The- to how long did it take to make uh, Sarma forgot to take out the trash? <laughs> Tell me. Yeah, yeah. Remember, remember that time. Yeah. So yeah, there was none of that. the one thing I did ask him though. I did ask him what it was like working with um with Josh Fries because he had worked yeah. with Josh in well Josh played some on that on the Village Gorilla Head record and then I'm pretty sure they were both in Guns and Roses at the same time. Um, yeah. um so so I know Nabil from then um and we just kind of kept in touch and then eventually he moved to new york um and started uh you know was working with uh you know beggars rough trade matador uh, and he had so, uh, a friend of mine who was working there uh, mike venutolo mantovani was he was working with nabil at matador and mike was putting a new band together called the Everyman. This is about 10 years ago. And I think Mike had asked Nabil if he, you know, of any drummer, you know, if he knew any drummers and Nabil gave Mike my name. So oh, nice. that's kind of how, that's kind of how Nabil and I reconnected. You know, Mike would come, uh, Nabil would come out to some of the Everyman shows and, um, you know, Nabil's just a cool dude, man, you know, and he's like, you know, once you, once you meet Nabil and you guys hit it off, it's like, you know, That's every time it. you every time you see each other, you just kind of pick up where you left off. You know, so I often, if I'm in a pinch or I'm in a tricky situation where I know I have to keep my cool, I often ask myself, "What would Nabil do?" Yeah, <laughs> that's a good that's a good uh, that's a good measure right there. Yeah, you know, W W N D. That's right. What would Nabil do? So, um, and then when I found out that his book was coming out, you know, I was excited about that and just kind of knowing a little bit, a little bit about his history and the book, you know, I pre-ordered it and when it came out, I, you know, devoured it and it's a great book. And, and, um, I caught up with him a couple of weeks ago. He was doing, he's doing, he's kind of continuing his continuing his book tour into this year. And he did a, a run down South. He came to Atlanta, um, Memphis, you know, he did maybe like a week down South. So I caught him. There's a great record shop 
close to me called Criminal Records. And I think he know he's he's friendly. Eric, um, I forget the dude who owns the place. I haven't met him, but he's uh, Nabil. No, no. I mean, Nabil probably knows every record store uh, owner in the country. You know, I think he knew everyone before he was at Four yeah. AD. But I think we did an in store there. It, probably. I mean, it's been, it's been a real staple, and it's been little an area called Little Five Points, which is right. Oh, you yeah. know what it is, man? It's right up the block from where you played with uh with hooky oh yeah all right it's like a couple blocks up from the from the variety playhouse right um so that's how i know nabil um and he's uh he's great man and I'll, you know i've reached out to him uh, you know when when i when i realize what his you know current like you know job is you know as far as the beggars you know kind of blows my mind because he's so at least for me you know not to like be name dropped but like he's so accessible man and he's the, he's so uh like approachable either in person or online if i hit, hit him up you know with a question about the biz you know he's like he'll get back to me with some insightful advice and uh uh, you know, not not what you would think of as uh, head of one of the all time best record labels would would respond. You know, he's a true sage. Yeah, yeah. Okay, enough about Nabil. He can come on and talk if he wants. Yeah, this isn't the Nabil show. Get his own couch. Welcome to Couchress, where we talk about Nabil Ayers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I so I I typically start with. Uh, you you are a multi instrumentalist. I've become that. Um, yes. Are uh, drums is drums? How do how do you say that? Is drums your first instrument? Are drums? Or drums your, is drums. Were drums your first instrument? The drums. Those drums. Were them were them drums your first it, instrument? <laughs> it they drums. <laughs> Uh, those drums, yeah, the drums are my, they're like, what I say, what I, I kind of came upon this and it's, you know, when I think about it, it's my, just like my little tag, um, uh, drummer by trade, songwriter by choice. So like drums is kind of my crap, you know, that's, that's kind of my, uh, um, that's, you know, my, my, my primary instrument and, yeah. um, that's how, you know, I'm a drummer first because I refer to the drums as an instrument. Right. So yeah, drums are like my primary instrument. That's what I start out. Start, that's what I started off on, and then slowly got into um, slowly got into all the other stuff. You know, some chords on the guitar, and then you know, figuring out just kind of uh, you know, chicken scratching my way through 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 the other things. Were, were you involved in school band or anything like that? In school band, um, the the school that I went to, the you know, bands were. Uh, I did some marching band stuff, like a little bit when th there was a, the high school in my town, when I was in like, uh, it was out, w w they had kind of like, I don't know what it was. It was some sort of like summer program, like the summer of my eighth grade, I believe, you know, they had some sort of program for, uh, or they, they had, you know, the grammar school kids kind of like can, can get, uh, some experience with, with the high school marching band in my town. Right. But I didn't. I didn't end up going to that. Um, I didn't end up going to that high school. Um, but doing the marching band stuff, it was like just enough marching band to, for it to be interesting, but to know that it wasn't like my thing. You know, some guys, especially right. drummers, like drumline stuff. That's their thing, and it's pretty badass, and it's a whole. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool when you yeah. see it done. You know, when you see the. Um, uh, you know, when you see the competitions and stuff and, and a lot of dudes, oh. you know, drummer kit players who come from the, the from the drumline world. I mean, those guys are ridiculous, you know. Um, yeah. So I did a bit of marching band stuff. And then the school that I went to, the band was like the band itself was not that great, but they had like a little jazz ensemble, which I got involved in. Um, and that was cool. cool. And that kind of got me into um, that kind of got me into the interested in, in the jazz world or in the jazz uh the jazz aspect of drumming um but mostly my 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 studies have, had always been kind of private i was taking taking private lessons i went to william patterson university which is a great music school jazz program and they also have a really good they have a really great percussion department um uh the the guy who headed up the 
the percussion department there was also doing the percussion department at, at SUNY uh, Stony Brook, I believe, in New York. And so I did some stuff with the percussion department at, at William Patterson. But as far as kit playing, that stuff had always been uh, private lessons with uh, with with um, players, you know, kit players or, um, you know, classical percussion, you know, did some classical percussion studies and like youth orchestra things when I was growing up. Yeah. This is in New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey. So this is all in the New York, New Jersey area that I was doing all this stuff. Where in New Jersey are you from? I'm from Rutherford. So Where is that? Rutherford is northern New Jersey. It's right okay. next to, it's about 15 miles, let's say, west of, of Manhattan. So it's, you know, East Rutherford and all the Meadowland stuff. Got it. It's west of that, Rutherford. Okay. Um, there is no, well, there is, so East Rutherford is right across the tracks and there's actually no, so actually West Rutherford is like Rutherford. Um, right. <laughs> so, and that's Bergen County. And I live, I grew up there and then I lived in Jersey city for about 15 years, um, from like 99 to 2014 before I moved Jersey in. city yeah. is a sleeper place. I mean, I, I don't think so anymore, but right. man, it's, uh, just as fast to get into, into the city as Brooklyn. Totally. And a lot cheaper, a lot cheaper. When I was maybe not anymore. When well, when I was kind of growing up, or when I either before I moved to Jersey City or right around the time that I moved to Jersey City, you know, you'd always see things in whatever the New York Times, you know, the Sunday Magazine or the real estate. It's like Jersey City is the next Brooklyn, and you know, it, it, every next couple, Williamsburg. Yeah, every couple of years this would happen, and it it never really caught until I think about I don't know, maybe it was post. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe once things really started getting nuts, once, once, once Brooklyn started to become, you know, once Brooklyn was like as, or if not more expensive than like Manhattan, people were like, Hmm, right. maybe Jersey city isn't, maybe it's not so, maybe the New Jersey stigma isn't all that, uh, isn't that horrible. And yeah, I mean, yeah. growing, living there, I, I would, I had a car, you know, so, uh, you know, driving into the city was always easy and the, the path trains would, would, was, was always easy. And my rent, I mean, my, my, uh, my quality of living was always good and for, for a cheaper price. And I mean, granted, it's never the same as living in somewhere, even though you're so close to it, it's never the same as living in New York or in Brooklyn. But like, I had no FOMO, man, when it came to like paying my monthly, my monthly rent and I was living by yeah. myself and I had like rooms, you know, that, that was, that was, uh, that was fine with me. The commute is no farther than, than Brooklyn. No. And also Brooklyn, you know, when bed has got West village apartment prices, you're in trouble. Yeah. I just think, come on, let's come on people. Let's go. There was a, an amazing studio in Jersey City. I visited it once. Did, um... Well, there was one in, I think it was actually Weehawken. It's probably still there. There's a place called Kaleidoscope. That's just the first one that came to mind. But there's another one. Oh, well, are you thinking Jersey City? It was right by that big, like, mega grocery store. Okay, that, I think, then, that, that one's in Hoboken, Water water Music. And it's funny, it's yeah. funny that you mention that because I often get mixed up... Um, Water music and water sound. Water sound being, um, I think water sound, Lenny Kravitz's dude, Hirsch, uh, Henry Hirsch, he had, uh -huh. uh, he, he, he was in New York. He had moved around a couple of times, but he had, a, he bought that church in Hudson, um, which I think was water sound, but the one in Hoboken is water music. He bought a church here? Yeah. Henry, I'm pretty sure it's Henry. I, I, I sometimes I think if it's Henry. It Hart. seems like I heard, I just heard about this last week. They were like, someone bought a church up there and it was going to be this whole thing, but it never materialized. Well, he was definitely, it was definitely a studio for a while. You know, like when he left, I think his last place before that was Manhattan. He left Manhattan, bought this church. And if I remember correctly, I did a record there uh, about 10 years ago and you know, like the main street in Hudson, yeah. it's like, and there's only like one main street in Hudson, right? Warren. Yeah. yeah. So I, if, if I remember correctly, it was like at the top of that main street. Yeah. And over, over a block. Yeah. And it was yeah. definitely, it was a studio. I mean, he had it for, a, you know, more than a couple of years. I think he'd been, 
you know, once Hudson started picking up, I, I don't know what is, what maybe he got, you know, kind of priced out of there, but it was, it was a beautiful studio. Um, yeah. but anyway, yeah. Hoboken is water music. And I actually did a record there with, um, with Charlie Hunter there, uh, a bunch of years ago. Oh, wow. And that was, yeah, they had like, um, across the street was a supermarket and they had, uh, the studio had some apartments upstairs and things. Um, and that was a great studio. I normally wouldn't want to jump timeline so so yeah. much, but this is the second time in a matter of just a few podcast episodes that Charlie has been mentioned. And what a phenomenal talent. Yeah. It's a freak. Ridiculous. Um, so we'll skip and just tell me how you came to play with him. Um, who can I ask first? Who is the, um, who is the other person you mentioned? Charlie, uh, Benji, Benji Johnson, okay. who, uh, is a studio owner in, uh, uh, North Carolina. Okay. Oh, and where he has yep. moved. Green. He lives in Greensboro now. That's yeah. right. Um, yeah. So he's been recording over there. Cause you're alone for one second, like one half of a second. Yeah, man. Oh yeah, smash, crash, boom. Um, thank you. I had to, one of the. Bo I thought you were gonna bust out one of those the crazy guitars or something. <laughs> Speaking of Charlie Hunter, here's my seventeen. No. no, I have one of the nice. Check this. One out. of the nice things about. Um, I got this, you know, I got a little home studio here and the heating, you know, there's an HVAC system. And fortunately the, the vents are, the one vent is on the floor so I can like oh, yeah. block it up. You know, it's, it's, it's not oh, like yeah. up high where I got to, you know, it's, it's, uh, I could easily kind of, uh, you know, muff, muffle it, which is what I just did. Yeah. Um, oh, so, sweet. oh yeah. So Charlie's in Greensboro is Benji's place in, in, in Greensboro. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Charlie's become yeah. a real kind of. He moved there a couple of years ago, and he's become uh, you know a real kind of fixture there. He's he's uh, he's embraced the community. I mean, it seems like he's really embraced the community. The community's embraced him, and he does a bunch of stuff uh, with a lot of local musicians, playing with local local players, and has been producing a lot of stuff. And um, the things that I've seen, uh, you know, he's been in some really cool studios. I'm sure one of the one of the video, more than one of the video clips, has has probably been at your friend's place. What's what's the what's Benji's place is called? Oh boy, uh, I'm a, I can't believe I'm going to screw this one up. I don't I don't remember uh, on uh, under okay. pressure. Sorry, Benji. That's fine. It'll come to you. It'll yeah. come to you when you if you want to remember something, forget it. So. It'll That's come to right. you. Something e e echoes. Uh, nah, no. Lost. So yeah, Charlie, Lost I played with Charlie. So that record that I did with Charlie, that, that it, was a, uh, it was an album called Songs from the Analog Playground. And that mm -hmm. was, a, uh, I think it was his last Blue Note record, actually. And that, that came out in 2001. Came out in 2001. And it was his first record that he had vocalists on there. So he had, Most Def was on there. Uh, and Houseman, Theral, uh -huh. Ther Theral from uh, Galactic was on there. Kurt Elling, who Charlie's yeah. been doing a lot of stuff lately with again. And Nora Jones yeah. sang on there. Um, so, and we re re recorded there. That was the second record that I did with Charlie. And then we toured. L let me stop for yeah. one second. How old are you when you made that record? I was uh, 27 young but probably uh, probably pretty experienced at this point we'll find out when we when we reel it back in your timeline right. but uh you're recording on a on a blue note album with this cast of characters i am at what was everyone in the in the room ever or did you lay down the basics and then he, you cut a track live with with most deaf he well, it was really cool with most actually uh because he was there w listening to the track that we were doing to the tracks that we were doing and he was in the uh he would be in the in the control room coming up with lyrics you know coming up with a melody we did we did two songs with him um 
a song. Uh, we did two two songs with him, and he was just kind of like writing in the room, and then he was he was recording there. The only person who wasn't there, everybody everybody was at the studio. The only wasn't uh, the only person who did it after was was Kurt Elling. He overdubbed his later, but everybody else was yeah. there. Uh, House Man came to the studio. Most Def came to the studio. Nora came to the studio. Um, so that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. And you know, every um, you know, most definitive, uh, you know, had been around obviously in House Man, and Nora was um, just kind of getting going. Like I don't even think her her first record was out yet. I don't think Come Away with Me was out yet. She was. She was not a household. She was not a household name, name, yet. name yet. I mean, she sounded like she was, you know, but she was. Yeah. She wasn't, you know, uh, capital capital letters Nora Jones yet. Um, and then right. she actually came out on the road with us too. So when after we did that record, when we did when we toured for that record, we would bring out some different um, singers. Um, Nora came out uh, for a couple of weeks for a couple of runs. Um, Jans, uh, a singer from a band uh, from um, Boulder called the Motet, he came out, and I'm totally blanking on his name. Same thing is going to come to me. The dude who was the singer in screaming headless torsos um came out for some shows um so you know we got to work with with you know singers in the studio and then um you know some vo- right. other vocalists kind of interpreted the material for the for the live shows How yeah cool. it was very cool i uh i i often think about moments where i've choked it wasn't it wasn't most but it was another rapper that i've super super respected i totally <laughs> choked meeting chuck d i was like waiting patiently while he was talking to someone <laughs> and then he like saw me just sort of like vulturing yeah. he felt he felt and you. then I'm he sure kind of looked he kind of like looked at me what? and he's like what what you know and i was like <laughs> and he just walked away but i feel like that would happen with yeah. with most. I I would just kind of be like, oh man, well I don't even know yeah. what to say. Wow. Yeah, it was fun. So, how much experience did you have under your belt at that point? Not, I mean, as a as a as a touring musician, I mean, my really my first kind of big tours, my first kind of actual like proper touring gigs were with Charlie. You know, I had done some kind of regional things with bands and some players growing up, but the, the first real gigs, you know, the first real tours were with Charlie, uh, on the album that I mentioned before that we did before songs from the analog playground, he put out, a uh, uh, it was just a self, it was a self-titled record called Charlie Hunter. And I played some percussion on that album. And that's how I met him. I met him through a, a, a drummer that I was studying with, a, a jazz drummer percussionist named Leon Parker, who, speaking of, up in New York, he was from. He's he was living in Mohegan Lake at the time, but he's from the White Plains kind of Poughkeepsie area. Really amazing mm-hmm. drummer. Uh, came up playing with Jackie Terrasan. Uh, he had this amazing trio with Jackie Terrasan and a bass player in Ugana Ukegwo. They had a trio for a bunch of years, did a bunch of Blue Note records. And I'd become, with, I'd become familiar with Leon through his first couple solo records. He put out a couple of records under his own name that were, they were full groups, but they were definitely percussion, you know, centric albums. And maybe I'd read about it in, I don't know, jazz times or something, you know, some, you know, kind of caught my eye drummer, you know, making a solo record and I checked it out and really enjoyed what, what he was doing. So going kind of, kind of going back to university and studying privately and things. And once I graduated college, graduated from William Patterson, I kind of, I graduated with a, with a communications degree and kind of realized that I wanted to really pursue music and kind of make that my main, um, my main path, and, which is something I'd always wanted to do. You know, it was kind of in the back of my mind, but once, you know, stuff started to get real kind of after school and like, you're, you know, you're kind of out there and you got to do something with yourself, you know, uh, I've realized that what I, what I really wanted to do was pursue music full time. So 
a couple of the first things that I did was to reach out to some of the players to re- I reached out to Leon, um, as, uh, you know, looking as a, a to take some lessons or, you know, to kind of take, take uh, from to take me on as a student. I reached out to Leon and I also reached out to Billy Martin from Modesky Martin and Wood. He was, yeah. he's from New Jersey and, you know, was there, you know, they've been, they had been in Brooklyn based, they were in Brooklyn and they had their, at that time, they had just kind of built their Shackland studios, you know, so they were still very much, a, they were still a band, you know, this is pre Wood Brothers and, and this is kind of when they kind of went first, went on to Blue Note. So they were still kind of, this is like post Shack Man, but you know, they're still kind of like in their prime, you know, and I'd, I'd become familiar with Billy through, uh, Friday afternoon in the universe album and his playing really caught my ear too being you know real groove player but also incorporating a lot of percussion you know percussion instruments and you know his brazilian thing really came through and his in his drum set playing so i reached out to billy and leon around the same time and they were both they were both uh in the area and they were both available for taking on students and so so that's that's what i did you know this is like late 90s i suppose you know 98 99 what, I mean, that's a lot of studying. What were you doing for work to be able to afford pr- these lessons? That's uh, yeah, that's tough. Yeah, so I was not to mention you've got student built loans that you're covering right, at that right. point. So I was working at when I was in school. When I was in college, I interned at. Impulse GRP Records in New York City, which at the time also had they were getting the Impulse catalog back up, um, so, you know, doing all the Coltrane and Archie Shep and all the, um, um, you know, oh, uh, all the reissues. Plus, like the Diana Krall was, you know, her her stuff was coming, starting to break. You know, her her uh, Nat King Cole record was really this is like late nineties. Danilo Perez, Eric Reed, Diana Krall. So Impulse was reissuing a lot of of their back catalog and doing a lot of things. So I was um, there was a bunch of cool stuff there. GRP, which was like. Um, you know, kind of like new jazz, George Benson and things like that. And was on there. Um, but they had the impulse catalog. They had, they were getting a blue thumb back up. Tommy LaPuma, uh, you know, well known for a lot of things, but I think he had come to GRP from Warner brothers. And back in the day, Tommy LaPuma had started a record called blue thumb records that did like, uh, you know, some Captain B farts. They did all kinds of stuff. You know, it was a really kind of crazy, like seventies label, Captain B fart, I can Tina Turner and, um, all kinds of stuff, but he got, he, yeah, good, good shit. Uh, great stuff. So he, he was getting the blue thumb label back going and, uh, their thing at the time, one of the, one of their big things was the candy butchers, Mike Viola. Um, they were one of the bands. And then also under impulse was giant, was giant step, which was a uh, groove collective, but we, the people was their record that had come out at that time. Um, and then giant step was also doing this thing called, uh, uh, a New York and soul with like, um, Roy Ayers and, uh, Eddie Palmieri and a bunch of old school, you know, salsa dudes pairing them wow. with like, uh, DJs, um, Kenny dope Gonzalez. And I forget the other dude, but, uh, so I was interning at a record label in, in college. And then when I, when I graduated, I started working for, uh, for BMG and kind of like the back office doing like royalty stuff, like royalty administration stuff. Right. Hey, can you get me? Yeah, I can up? get you hooked up. I, st- I still got a bunch of, <laughs> like, I still got a bunch of free CDs. I got a bunch of CDs. I, ha- I still haven't opened from 20 years ago. They're still in the shrink wrap. I'll send them to you. <laughs> Everybody knows you sell those on tour yeah. so that you can eat. Of course. Oh yeah. I was sending, I was sending a lot of care packages to people. Um, so yeah, I was doing that. I was working as a, uh, I mean, I, I didn't have an accounting background, but it was, it was, uh, it, it was, it was a kind of an accounting position, but not real like CPA accounting stuff, you know? So that's what I was right. doing work wise. Um, and then in school I was, you know, I did, you know, working at like record shops and things, but like my, you know, kind of grown up job out of college was doing this, doing the, the royalty stuff at, uh, at BMG. And so you had this nine to five and then you're, you're going and just working on your chops and studying and taking lessons 
And what about gigging? The gigging that I was doing, you know, I, I wasn't really doing too much gigging. I had, I had a band that, um, I had a steady band when I was in college, uh, that we did a bunch of stuff. You know, we, we, we played a bunch and, you know, in and around New York city and, um, a friend of mine, my friend Gabe was interning and then became a house engineer at, at, uh, the power station, you know, which then became avatar and is mm. now the power station again. So we, and it's funny, I just recently, uh, I recently dug out my friend asked if like I dug out, I, I went through my files and found a cassette of the, of what, of what we recorded at the power station. So, you know, after hours, Gabe wow. would, you know, we would go into the power station and, and if, if recorded in the power station, then like, but you know, no. they're, 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 I've they're like studio there, a, but... I mean, you know, it's just like, it's a cathedral, man. And it's the places. So we would, you know, we would go in there after hours and we recorded a handful of tunes and, um, you know, did the like shopping or, or as much as what we thought was shopping around at the time for, you know, a bunch of, you know, kids who don't know what they're doing, you know, it what was, kind of music was that? um, probably, you know, it's funny. I like need to listen to it again, but from what I remember, you know, a very kind of college rock yeah. at the time, you know, maybe like REM ish, um, uh, uh, original stuff, you know, it was a four piece guitar, bass, drums, uh, lead guitar player mm -hmm. sang and, and, um, uh, I mean, you know, I, I think it would probably fit in the like nineties college alt rock, you know, early 120 minutes yeah. uh, stuff. Sure. So, you know, playing okay. with them and then, um, but, you know, as far as like, you know, when I was working and studying, I wasn't really gigging too much. A friend of mine had a percussion on stomp, uh, a, a friend of mine who lived in, in Montclair, you know, not far from me in New Jersey, uh, he had a percussion ensemble that, that we did some stuff together, but I wasn't like, um, you know, I didn't come up in the New York you know, I didn't go to school and, you know, I didn't do the music school thing. So I wasn't really like dialed into the, to the, to the New York, uh, you know, to the New York scene, um, of, of like the, you know, session right. players and, you know, doing gigs at the living room, you know, like I wasn't really, uh, that stuff came after, but when I was studying, it was pretty much just like working and studying and practicing. And, and, uh, there was also a guy, a great, uh, kit drum set player, not far from me where I live named Sal LaRocca, who, uh, I was also studying with, you know, a lot more kind of traditional, you know, getting my kind of hands together and things. So basically it was like work and studying, you know, uh, and then, you know, I would go on some gigs with Leon and he would have me, kind of sit in on some gigs and but i wasn't really i wasn't really like on the scene at that time it well it seemed to work out because you were getting some uh some good gigs all of a sudden yeah i mean time, through right? the through the the leon charlie connection um and god that, that was yeah that the was the first, first one. one so so, wow. so <laughs> what a first, yeah, what I know, a first I know it was, there were a lot of like, I mean, even now, but especially then there were a lot of like pinch me moments, you know? And so kind of tying things together, Charlie's a Bay area guy, you know, he grew up in Berkeley, Oakland, um, came yeah. up Bay area, moved to New York, you know, from what I understand, probably kind of like outgrew the Bay Area scene, you know, uh, moved to Brooklyn in in the late, I think probably late 90s, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. And one of the first people that he played with was was Leon, you know, kind of sought out Leon and they did a record together called Duo, one of Charlie's records. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's a Charlie Hunter, Leon, Leon Parker uh, album called Duo. And that's how they met. Or that's how, you know, that's how they kind of got their thing together. And then when Charlie was getting ready to do another record, he wanted to have Leon play on the album again with some, you know, kind of fill out the bands, you know, some fill out the band with some horns and things. And I don't know whose idea if it was, if it was Charlie's or Leon's idea, but Leon had the idea of instead of having him kind of sitting behind a drum set to kind of do a percussion ensemble, you know, a small uh, kind of like, you know, traps rhythm section, you know, somebody playing one person playing a snare drum, 
one person playing a cymbal, another play, person playing, uh, excuse me, another person playing some some percussion, somebody playing like a floor tom as a bass drum. So Leon in, had invited me and another one of his students to kind of make up this, you know, percussion ensemble in the studio. And we actually did it wow. at the power station, which was cool. You know, we, you know, I was like back at the power station. Um, How yeah. fucking cool. Yeah. Is there video footage of that going down? No, no. This was um, this was kind of dawn, the dawn of the dawn of digital cameras, and definitely before uh, you know phone cameras yeah. and things. So smartphones. Not you know. too much footage of that, and and and, and this was before my. Um, shortly thereafter, once I started touring regularly, I became kind of obsessed with. Uh, disposable cameras and this was even before my kind of disposable camera phase oh yeah so um so yeah we did that record and then uh and then when charlie was getting ready to tour on the record uh he asked me to play uh you know to come out on tour and he got another percussionist named uh chris lovejoy to 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 play in the band so for a while it was it was the three of us it was charlie myself on a little tiny drum kit, like a, like a, uh, ride cymbal, kick drum, snare drum. And then Chris Lovejoy was playing Kungus percussion. And then after a couple months, we got a saxophone player, a dude named John Ellis. Um, uh, mm -hmm. and then it was the quartet for a while. You know, we toured for, for a while as, as the four of us, a bunch of stuff in the States and, you know, the whole jazz, um, jazz festival stuff overseas and did some other, you know, like went to Israel and Brazil and uh, all kinds of stuff, and then did the the, the songs from the Analog Playground record. And it was about two years. I did the I did the Charlie did the Charlie gig. Doing those festival dates must have been totally. just a, a treat, and an ins like so much fun both. And it, it was really my first time. <clears throat> excuse me, first time like really traveling. Um, you know, outside of the country, traveling. You know, internationally. So, I mean, and I, I you know, I, I definitely, uh, uh, I was, I definitely appreciated it at the time. Um, and, you know, did as much, uh, kind of like exploring and things that, that, uh, that, that, that I could, that I could have done, you know, you're not in, in places for too long. Um, but, uh, right. yeah, we did some cool stuff and those were, um, you know, going to Italy and, uh, um, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, we did some stuff, you know, a couple of places we would go and we would get to spend some time like Sao Paulo, Brazil. We spent maybe, you know, maybe about a week. Um, yeah, That's it was great. Wild place, it was great. Man. And we got to study with some, some percussion dudes there, which was a lot of fun. Um, when we went to Israel, we did like, you know, probably about a week of week of shows there. And in Japan, we went to, we did a, we did a really fun tour. It was a double bill with John Schofield's band. It was like the Uber, the Uber jam band at the time. Wow. And we did a run of uh, yeah. blue note, like the blue note clubs, uh, Osaka and Tokyo. And, um, we did like a bunch of those in Japan. So those were fun. I am right now at this moment. I am so retroactively stoked for young you. Just like yeah. soaking it in. I know. First gig. Yep. Going everywhere. Yeah. Actually everywhere it was great. in the world. Spoiled for sure. You know? Spoiled but I always like spoiled, but not like in a bratty way, like fortunate. You know, it was like very um very yeah. fortunate. I didn't I didn't really I didn't I didn't take it for granted, you know. I so I, I, I soaked in as much as I possibly could have. That is a, that's an unbelievably great first stamp yeah. in your gig yep. passport book. Uh, so after that, next? so Charlie, as you know, he's, he's got, um, you know, he's, he's always doing a bunch of stuff and doing, you know, juggling, uh, different things. And, and when he does have a band, a steady band for a while, um, you know, he changes things up every, every once in a while. So after about the two year mark, he was kind of getting ready to move on. And, um, this was end of, oh, I don't know, end of, end of 20, end of 2001, um, 2000. Yeah. So 
he let us know that he was kind of, you know, going to be kind of moving on after, you know, after the Japan dates or like at the, be- what, you know, at a certain point, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like we finished the show on a Friday night and Saturday night, he had like a next, a new band, you know, he gave us, he did it, you know, he's a classy dude and right. he gave us, you know, w- w- far enough notice to kind of, um, you know, so, so nobody was like kind of, uh, caught, caught off guard or blindsided. So, Around that time, one of the residencies that we were doing, uh, we we're doing a residency in New York is this place called No More, which isn't, which is No More, but it was on like North Moor and uh, I don't know, it was off Canal or something. It was a little corner spot, this little funky place that had a, mm-hmm. you know, this like nightclub spot that had a, a, you know, music room and like a, you know, balcony. It was a cool spot. So we did a residency there and I think... Um, during one of those, or during one of those shows or at that residency, John Mayer was, a uh, as a fan, is a fan of, of Charlie Hunter's. And he was, he was probably in New York at the time recording his first album. And he came out, he had come out to see, uh, one or more of those, uh, shows that, that we were doing those residency shows at No More with Charlie. And, um, also, another thing, uh, another album that, that that I was involved in at the time, Chris Lovejoy, who I mentioned, who was the percussionist with Charlie, we did a percussion album called Brain Trust that we recorded at Good and Evil in Brooklyn uh, with uh, Scotty Hard, Scott Harding. Percussion album with, like, guests. You know, Charlie Hunter played some guitar on there. Billy Martin came and played some percussion. And yeah. um, Danton Bowler, a great bass player. So we did this percussion album. It's called Brain Trust. It was recently like the 20th anniversary of that of that album, and it's on Spotify and all the all the places. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, it's called I'm Brain Trust, and um, we had the guys who were doing. They probably still do it too. The guys who were doing, uh, you know, the early days of kind of, uh, you know websites and things we had uh, a couple friends of ours put up a website we had a you know chopek lovejoy brain trust website where we you know we sold the cds from there and had you know some contact information you know all kind of basic web website stuff and john mayer had sent me an email at some point during my during my time with charlie like you know introducing himself and you know i'm a musician too and i i uh you know just i'm my record is coming out and I'm putting together a band to tour. And, um, I don't know if he, if he, he was, he was in the same stage as Nora was. And John, when you, totally. uh, same thing. When you did totally. the Charlie early two thousands, you know, right before, but you yeah. know, his record came out and I think maybe his, his record was already out on a, a smaller Sony label, Columbia label called aware. And it was about to get the big push, you know? So, he yeah. had, you know, he had reached out to me, got my email address through the, uh, I guess through the brain trust, you know, through the brain trust thing. And, um, you know, sent me, you know, he's like, I'm a musician too. And here's my, you know, this is my, this is my music. And, um, again, I don't remember if he was like invited, you know, asking if <laughs> me to play or if he, if he, if I knew anybody who he, who I could recommend to, you know, for him to put his band together. And after listening to his stuff, I was like, you know, as most people at the time or even now still, you know, hearing John Mayer stuff for the first time was kind of, you know, it was kind of wowed at the everything, you know, the songs, the, the guitar playing, the, um, you know, the production, you know, uh, and, um, you know, I thought that I, you know, that would, that would be a fun gig to play, but I was in, you know, I was doing the Charlie thing and John, you know, Charlie, John was just kind of getting started and I was, you know, I was committed to the Charlie gig. And so I wasn't, you sure. know, I wasn't going to like jump ship. Um, but I gave him a couple of recommendations for drummers. And then, you know, a couple months later when Charlie was, get, was, was getting ready to do something new, I reached back out to John to, uh, you know, the things that you do when you're, when you're, about when you're when you're either in between gigs or about to be in between gigs, just kind of putting the word out that uh, you know that you're available, and if 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 you if, if you, hey if you hear anything hear anything here's you know that whole thing. So I'd done that. Uh, you know, reached out to John, and and he was actually getting ready to 
he was looking for another drummer again. The drummer that he that that he that he was touring with at the time was Matt Johnson, um, great drummer. Uh, Duncan Sheik, Jeff Buckley, St. Vincent, you know, Matt Johnson. Yeah. Great drummer. Yeah. Cool, Great super drummer. cool dude. Matt was getting ready to leave the the tour. So John John needed a drummer. So the timing worked out well with that, you know. Uh I was leaving Charlie's band. John was looking for a drummer. So so I went, you know, went out on that. I did it uh I did a couple of uh I went out on a couple of shows while Matt was still in the band, you know, like the le- Matt's last three or four shows just to kind of get a feel for the gig. And, and that was a lot yeah. of fun for me to, to, you know, to meet Matt and to see Matt play. I'd been a fan of Matt's through the, through the Jeff Buckley album, you know, before that. Um, so that was cool. And then I did the, um, so for yeah. my sake and for people listening sake, when you sort of like do short term understudy on a gig like that, a lot of times you are you're not just going to like listen to the band. There are certain dynamic things that happen in a show where there will be cues. Is that some of the stuff you were? Yeah, sure. Like, like um, keying in you know, on just there? kind of how the show, kind of how the show flowed, and what kind of the what what kind of like the dynamics of the show right. were. You know, what kind of gig it is. I mean, you know, sometimes um, somebody's record is is different than what their live performances are, you know, uh, you know, like a, uh, a record sometimes it's just a blueprint for a live show, uh, you know, as far as how, uh, the songs de- uh, develop or just kind of what the overall dynamics of a show, you know, a real kind of rock and album might not be so rock and live or like a mellow album. Might- yeah. Or, or the other way around or vice versa. So, yeah. And they probably they want to have a seamless totally. experience. Yeah, for totally. Because he was playing, too. you know, some big big rooms by that point, and people were certainly aware of him. You know, b- people, you know, expected a show. Uh, uh, you know, some. What were the so at that time when I signed time? on? It was you know like college gigs, like eight hundred room, you know, eight hundred people uh, college things, or like a yeah. um, Irving Plaza, um, and those kinds of rooms you know, ballroom kind of stuff. Yeah. And then Matt left and then I did that tour. I did the, the mayor tour for the, for his first record for the room for squares, did that for, for about a year, you know, just like a, uh, uh, 2002 to 2003. And in there we did a live record called, um, any given Thursday. We recorded in Arkansas. Uh, no, I'm not in Arkansas in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and that was released as a live yeah. album and a DVD too, you know, so, which was really cool to have, yeah. you know, cause as you know, uh, a lot of times the, the, the players, uh, in the band, you know, in the touring band aren't necessarily the guys on the album. Um, so it was nice to have like a document of that, of that band. Um, yeah. So that, that was great. And we, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of traveling, you know, but, it's good that you played with him with, when you did, because he hasn't done very much. It was all really downhill since, since then. then. <laughs> I really caught the wave on that, because since then, I mean, who? You know? He's he's now, he's on... Um, yeah. It's, it's a trip, man. He's doing now a... Uh, he just, you know, and last year he did a full band thing, you know, first kind of time back out after the, you know, I think after the, uh, after the you know, the COVID stuff. He's doing a solo tour now, of like uh arenas you know arenas uh, or at least here in atlanta he's playing and you know just you know like one <laughs> guy you know solo arena arena shows that's amazing just a guy walk out Three. there with an acoustic guitar For an arena. On a stool james awesome. taylor style yeah it's amazing and yeah, he's great and he was great to play with great to work with um and it was fun, you know, it was really fun too, to see that, you know, speaking of like that, that wave, that time, like, you know, to see that kind of trajectory, you know, again, by the time I got in the band, he was certainly on his, on his way, but you know, each time, each leg of the tour, it got a little bigger and a little bigger yeah. and to, to really kind of see that, that, that lift off was really a unique experience. It was cool. How cool. So at this point you were like. I've had 
two gigs with like the two of the most recognizable at either at either ends of the spectrum, but two of the most yeah. recognizable names in guitar. Mm-hmm. Right? And that remain yeah. to this day. Um what's going on in your mind? Are you like, I'm gonna live forever? What's going on in my mind is so man. I mean, I was just really enjoying it at the time. And, uh, you, you know, again, doing my best to like, not, you know, and, and realizing like the unique, not just the u- uniqueness of those gigs, you know, cause there's like a handful of gigs that are like, you know, just real kind of, um, that are just great. I mean, there's a lot of great gigs out there, you know, but as far as like profile gigs, you know, high profile gigs, um, you know, I realized the uniqueness of, you know, char- you know, the Charlie gang going from one, one of those gigs to the other and realizing that, um, you know, being really grateful and like being prepared for, you know, uh, uh, for that, you know, for, for the next step to be, you know, the same or bigger, but also knowing that, you know, eventually you're back in the van, you know, at some point, yeah, who knows? Yeah, be back who, in the van. Who knows be back how the... long it lasts? Fifth, as I like to say, fifteen yeah. minutes goes by. And you know, fast. sometimes you get, and and uh, and you know, again, having it in my mind, and not not have not not not, not that I was like some like uh, you know uh, music biz vet at the you know vet at the time, but really kind of knowing how you know how those things go for for not only you know, the marquee per entertainers, you know, who kind of get, you know, you know, recycled in and out of popularity, but, you know, as being a side man, knowing that, uh, not every gig is a, is a, is a, is a, is a not every gig is a, um, tour bus gig, you know, I mean, you're not going to be on a tour bus for every, every, every one of your gigs, you know? Yeah. Gigging yeah. is a fickle mistress. So I was, say. um, you know, enjoying myself and also prepared for, for whatever, man, you know, um, are you yeah. still, while you're, while you're touring, are you, are you study like you're in a bus, you guys also have hotels? Hotels too, bus? definitely with the Charlie, the Charlie thing was always van runs and hotels. And then sometimes with the, uh, we would have hotels, you know, like day rooms or depending on how long we were somewhere, you know? Yeah. Are you like drum padding that where I'm headed is like, how are you keeping up? Like, are you plateauing and just doing the gig or when you're not on stage, are you, are you shedding like my shedding? No, no, I was like, I was definitely, uh, I've always been like a warmer upper a warm upper, but as far as, you know, putting, uh, you know, putting Mm -hmm. my, uh, you know, putting my hour, you know, on, on the pad every day. Um, not, not so much when I'm, when I'm traveling, uh, you know, at home is a different thing. And in between, you know, in between, uh, runs or in between tours, kind of keeping things going, but n- no, not, not like a, not an avid, uh, practicer, uh, on the road. Yeah. Typically. All right. Then you, do you immediately after so after that, that I did Jesse? a I did a summer run with um uh with Mark Broussard. He was uh he had he had started working with some of the guys with part of the management team that John was working with. Did a little summer run with Mark Broussard, and then and then after that, I did the Jesse gig for a while. Um, that was super fun because I had been, I'd become aware of Jesse, uh, probably around the time that he put out fine art of self-destruction, which just that this year is the 20th anniversary. And he put out like a 20th anniversary issue of the record and he's doing a 20th anniversary tour in, um, in the UK. And there, uh, I think coming up maybe even next weekend, uh, Webster hall, I believe he's doing a big show with like Tommy's going to be there and Lucinda Williams and Cat Popper and, uh, you know, and, uh, he's doing like a big show there. So, uh, who knows, man, maybe Maybe it'll be, you know, Christmas and, uh, Christmas in March. 
Yeah, Bruce Springsteen's a big fan of um, Jesse's, which is pretty he's cool. A big, he's a Very big cool. fan. Um, yeah, Jesse, I became aware of him. You know, that was another uh, a case of being, you know, being a fan of somebody uh, and having the kind of privilege to 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 play with somebody who, who you're a fan of, which is a it's always a plus, you know, I mean, it's always, it's always nice to play with great players, but there's just always something kind yeah. of special when it's somebody that you've, you know, when you're playing the songs that just not too long ago, you were like playing along in your rehearsal space or, you know, playing in your, in your car stereo or something. Yeah, man. Um, and you know, super extra bonus when you play with them and they're like cool people, which is, which is definitely the case with Jesse. Um, so yeah, did the did the did a couple runs with Jesse, and then did a, uh, a couple of years with a band out of Connecticut. This band called the Alternate Roots. Um, uh, I'd met them through their through their through their manager, you know, through like um, just kind of music scene, East Coast music scene stuff. Did um, did a couple of years with them, mm -hmm. and that was a lot of fun. That was a, that was a uh, that was a you know kind of that was a those dudes are great players, great songwriters. And we were touring on their, their first record for that, the time that I was in the band and did a bunch of cool stuff. Uh, and that was, that was a fun, you know, as far as, you know, back in the van gigs go, that was like, that was like the best, you know, cause sometimes, right. you know, you, you get, you get back in the van and it's an old stinky broke down van. And sometimes, you know, you get back in a van and it's like, you know with good dude yeah there's no um pretty tight you know no running off the road van stories <laughs> or no uh, uh you know no no how harrowing tales of uh of snowstorms in in colorado or anything you know this was like yeah. this was this was a good run of uh this was a good run with these dudes they were good Great. dudes and actually re, re, re uh you know reconnected with them a couple years later to do a tour and we're still friends and um so then did a couple of years with them, the alternate roots, good dudes. Throughout, throughout all this period of time, yep. in between tours, when you come home or in between gigs, um, what are you doing to stay busy? Are you teaching? Are you studying? Are you, do you have a record store job? Are you delivering when pizza? I are you, I mean, are you, or are you a, a studio? Are you a, do you I keep all, all keep of my per, all diems of per diems and I um uh do my best to like um you know keep a keep a uh, keep a safety net you know at the time like keeping a safety net for in between you yeah. know for the in between tour stuff and you know fortunately the times in between runs and tours were not so long that you know, the, the well would run completely dry in between tours, you know, and, you know, in between tours, doing some, doing some local things or some, you know, recording sessions. Uh, but no, most of the time, you know, in between tours, it would be like, um, uh, it would be just kind of laying low, you know, um, and realizing yeah. that, local gigging a little bit, local a little bit, you know, again, jams, it wasn't, anything? um, I, I wasn't, yeah. Because my first, you know, full time ex gigging experiences were like on the road and away. You know, it's it's hard to establish yourself, and once you do establish yourself, to maintain the road and home thing. You know, um, so being that, it's pretty funny. Like when you when you go off and you're like gone for two years, and then you come home, and someone's like, "So what's the scene in Brooklyn like?" And you're like. I don't, I don't know. know. You got to like call I, people I, to tell them you're I still alive no and that you're still, you know, still, you know, so. Yeah. Exactly. This yeah, was phone calls and, and, you know, hey, you remember me stuff. You know? Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So most of the, you know, most of my life, my, my world, my working world was, was away from, away from home. Um, you know, it wasn't until I was, uh, it wasn't until I was home on, on a more steady basis that I, that I got involved with the local scene, you know, the New York scene, the living, you know, living room stuff and early Rockwood things. And, um, so yeah, but at this point I, I, I'm just like, uh, 
you know, uh, coming home and um, cooking at home, you know, preparing my own meals. I love to cook at home. Man, I make a what's mean. Your what's your favorite? Uh, I make a mean lentil cook? soup. Yeah, it's pretty good. Is that right? My secret is everything. What's I your put secret? everything in. There. I put in the the right amounts of like all the, you know, cumin, curry, salt, pepper, you know, and even, you know, like oregano, basil, yeah. and olive. Oh, you know what I think really kind of makes it is um, uh, the, the proper combination of like um, olive oil and uh, coconut milk, you know, to, to, so it's like creamy, but creamy, but not oily, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think those are kind mm. of like the, uh, um, you know, the things that you wouldn't think or that I wouldn't think. So like, uh, you know, like kind of the special sauce, olive oil, coconut milk, um, uh, diced, diced tomatoes, which is, you know, pretty standard. But then also some like uh, some brags or soy sauce, you know, uh, uh, and um, and then I like to put sure. in addition to like cayenne, you know, powdered hot stuff, also some uh uh, my favorite hot sauces are uh, Valentina and or uh, Cholula. I like, so I'll make sure those are in there too. Yeah. Um, oh, those are my favorites. And then if the, if it gets a little too, and then also some lemon, you know, the lemon adds a nice flavor and also, yeah, it's vegan. Yeah. Is it a, so, is it a vegan? And then the lemon I find uh, is a nice flavor and it also neutralizes the, the hotness of it too. So, yeah. Lentil, that's what I'll go for. And, you know, you can make a nice big yeah. pot of lentil soup and then have some quinoa or brown rice also. And then that's, uh, you're good to go with that for at least a week, you know? Yeah. That's it. And when you get totally. sick of it, you can freeze it and have it a month later. I'm big on roasting. Vegetables. About 15 years, I've just been roasting the shit out of everything. Chicken. Yeah. Mainly veg. Some chicken, you know, I don't... I. It's not that I have an aversion to cooking meat or even necessarily... Like, I don't... I know I shouldn't probably eat meat. And I don't eat a lot okay. of it. But when I cook, I'm mostly cooking veg. So roasting... A lot of, a lot of roasted veggie soups and... Yeah. Or uh, roasted veggies and rice. Roasted veggie pastas. Um, roasted and tomato the pasta uh, sauce. you know the cooking meat thing that's kind of when I started on the you know so I do vegan but you know vegetarian first but that's kind of what when I when I moved out and you know was living on my own and you know fending for myself and things and was starting to you know experiment with cooking and you know I grew up eating meat and but just something about um, cooking meat myself you know something about cook, cooking flesh you know like me doing it myself like like first at first i thought like uh i don't i don't know how to cook chicken and i've heard you know you hear these kind of urban legends or these horror stories of like uncooked chicken and somebody right. touched the chicken and then you know it touched the raw chicken and then <laughs> the, the knife and then they're dead and then you cut the yeah, carrots and it's so like that but then also the, the, the yeah. fact of cooking you know cooking meat really wasn't my thing so that was the beginning of my um my phasing out meats just sort of all of it handling yeah, it. Yeah, and the, it's in that and, weird plastic yeah. package. It so creeps, yeah, so same thing. Really, out, the, yeah. that, that, like the, the the uncomfortability factor, the uncomfortableness of cooking meat was was I, I feel you. Welcome to the Couch Cook Podcast, couch. where we talk about cooking. <laughs> uh, what would Nabil do? Um, <laughs> so uh at what point do you end up memphis, in, in memphis was um let me think here so i'll, I'll like so post um so post alternate roots I, I i i was playing with the alternate roots until 2008 and at that point i was kind of burnt out on on what i was doing you know, I, I just really kind of felt, you know, I really kind of felt like the hamster yeah. wheel effect of like, 
gig, no gig, tour, no tour. And, and like, I wasn't really enjoying myself. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, who I was with. It was like, um, and, and looking back on it now, uh, realizing that I just wasn't, um, I wasn't like diversifying myself, you know, I was doing like too much of not just too much of the same thing at one time, but also like cyclical and like that, you know, just like that, the, the pattern, the side man hustle thing. And the, you know, it's like, it can be, you know, it can be invigorating and it'd be fun, but it, you know, um, it can just kind of be exhausting too. You know, I was, I just wasn't enjoying myself, you know? So I had taken a, I took a year off of, yeah. uh, of playing. Like I didn't play, um, drums. I, I, I became aware of this organization through my, my girlfriend at the time, wife now, Abby, she told me about this thing called AmeriCorps, which is like, um, uh, which is like Peace Corps, but domestic. I think Clinton had set it up, um, uh, during his administration and basically, you know, they operate as the Peace Corps does, but within the United States, you know, setting up their volunteers, um, w- with, um, um, you know, emergency food providers or homeless shelters or, um, you know, Habitat for Humanity kinds of things around the country. So that was something I was interested in, you know, for the sake of what it was, but also it was, you know, pretty far removed from what I was doing. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't, re- I didn't want to stop touring and then like, you know, g- give lessons or stop touring and work in a record store. Like I wanted to really not do music, you know, uh, I, 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 I wanted to really take a hard like pivot to really just give myself a break, you know? That's about totally. as far from which, performance work. Which as worked you out can well get. again for for a number of reasons. I was working for uh I was volunteering at this um emergency food provider in in uh in Manhattan that did outreach uh programs and, and uh you know soup kitchen things and um and it was great. I did that for a year. And so the way they the way they do it is similar to the Peace Corps, you're a volunteer, but you also get a stipend. You get kind of like a living wage, you know? So that was another, that was another bonus is that it was a, it was, you know, technically a volunteer position, but you're also getting a stipend. You're able to do it. You're able to do it full time. So I did that uh, for you. Right. What's that? Every job is volunteer. I yeah, suppose. exactly. So some, some have bigger Every stipends job is than volunteer, others. I suppose. Um, <laughs> So I did that and, yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, thinking back, looking back on it, like, I don't think I even like picked up a set of drumsticks during this time. Um, it w- what did that do to your soul? What did that do to just like the way you view it the world? Was, it was, it was, it was kind of liberating, you know, I, I didn't feel any, um, Again, I didn't. Th- there was no big sense of loss there because it was something that I was, that I felt I kind of needed to do at the time, and knowing too, somewhere in the back of my head that this was not a permanent thing. You know, like I'm, like I'm, I'm pro- I probably haven't completely turned my back on this stuff. You know, but then also at the time, what I was doing musically was um, I was taking some guitar lessons and kind of uh, getting, you know, some more knowledge on like other instruments that I was, that I was interested in and kind of really diving into songwriting and, you know, uh, studying guitar and practicing guitar. And so that was like, that was like my musical outlet. You know, I wasn't completely in like a, in a music desert, you know? So so that was great. I did that for a year. And then after that year, um, I did, I, I, I did some, uh, some busking, you know, went into the subways and, and, uh, brought my acoustic guitar and kind of, you know, instead of practicing at home, I would kind of practice at the, uh, 
one of my favorite spots was like the canal and Broadway, uh, you know, stop and, um, uh, you know, some different, some yeah, days man. I would take out an acoustic guitar and then for, for the purpose of, of busking, I, I also bought a, a cajon, you know, the box drum that you sit on and I brought that out and would do that. And, you know, we'd kind of do that for a couple hours yeah. a day, um, uh, every day during the week. And, and that's how I kind of got myself back into, um, music mind, you know? Did, um, New York is for people not uh, for people listening or watching. Yep. New York is a very big, populated place. Did you run into people that you knew in the subway? I mean, it's it's remarkable how if you are paying attention, because so often you're cruising through and you're just like head down. Yeah, you know, you're just like get me get me through this. I'm going to get out of here. But if you if you look up and you pay attention, yeah. there's fucking people that you know everywhere. Um, did you did you see people just that once you or twice? Knew? Maybe it wasn't like it wasn't like every day. You know, I was I was like, what are the chances? It was just once or twice. You know, in in the right. in the I don't know maybe four to six months that I was doing it, it was just a, it was just not even a handful of times that happened. Uh, but maybe they saw me and were like. Yeah. You know? Maybe. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So many people Man, saw me. dude is really down but on I his didn't luck. See them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um and then um uh and then I slowly started to, you know, just, just you know, once you kind of manifest some, something or once you kind of put yourself into to a certain position again, you know, kind of re um uh, you know, rekindled relationships with some of my musician friends and people who were living in Manhattan and in Brooklyn. And, um, and it was th during that time that, that I started to get involved with like the local scene and songwriters and doing gigs at the, uh, you know, doing living room gigs and doing gigs at Rockwood and, um, started to get involved with, with the with the music community in Jersey City, which was pretty happening, there was a cool band uh, called Jack Parsons Moonchild, which was like an experimental, like a uh, velvety undergroundy kind of band, which was a lot of fun. So it was really the first time that I was able that I was at home and not kind of running off on tour uh, every every couple months. That I was able to to establish myself at home, which was great. And then that's when I got involved with also the 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 band that that Nabil had re recommended me for, and then also started playing with a band called the Pimps of Joy Time out of Brooklyn, kind of a funk soul band. Started touring with them. Uh, well, who Brian do, uh, Jay who, who is the I, leader. Someone in that band? Morales is a great singer. She was in the band. Chauncey Yearwood a great singer, um, percussionist, Dave Bayless was a bass player and they're all like, um, you know, New York, New York cats. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe and, it's, uh, and he, maybe Brian, Brian J. It. He also has got a thing. I think he just came out with a new record today. He's got a thing called Gitkin. Uh, um, and that was, that was a lot of fun. Did a bunch of touring with them. Uh, played with them for about two years, played with the Everman for about four years. And then in 2014, which is where we are now in this conversation, my... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, it's not 2014? Abby, <laughs> who I mentioned earlier, she got a... She she did a graduate... At, a graduate she did a graduate degree at NYU and through her graduate program, got a fellowship, mm. a, a Bloomberg fellowship that was placing mm. um, people around the country uh, in uh, mayors. Uh, uh, there was a thing called the Mayor's Initiative Delivery Team. And so they would place their fellows in uh, cities around the country like um uh, Chicago, New Orleans, I think Los Angeles, uh, and Memphis, where, where Abby, uh, went was in Memphis. So at the time we were, uh, 
she's from New York. She was living in Brooklyn when we met. We were living in Jersey City together. She moved to Memphis uh, to to do her her, her her Bloomberg fellowship, and you know we talked about what uh, so her, her her fellowship was for a year, and then after the year ended, it became a full time thing. You know, she's they they wanted her to stay on, and she did. So we spoke about what that would meant if we wanted to do like a long term thing, or if she would come back to you know she would come back to New York to the East Coast, or if I would go down there, and without too much thought you know primarily to you know to, to to be for abby and i to be together to you know to get our you know to to get our, our our thing going together like in the same place without doing a long distance thing um i decided to move down there without really um without really too much hesitancy i was ready i was ready for a move i was ready to you know to to be down there with her and i was ready for uh change, you know, kind of just kind of lifestyle wise, I was, I was right. definitely a change of pace. Um, Certainly the, a change from, from of going, pace. you know, being born and raised in the, uh, in the, on the East coast, you know, not just like in the, uh, on the East coast, but like in New Jersey, you know, which is, you know, everything on the East coast is very specific, but you know, New Jersey yeah. particularly uh, has a very, you know, specific East coast presence. Um, and I'd been down south before, you know, I'd been through, but, yeah. but hadn't, uh, you know, on tours and things and had visited Abby while she was living down there and it felt really cool. And I knew I was kind of getting into like a, uh, um, uh, a, a different culture down there. Uh, but I was ready for it, man. I was ready for a change again, a change of lifestyle. I was ready for a career change. Yeah. Um, and just not knowing what I was getting into, as far as just how I would make things work down there as a musician, I, I, I was of course familiar with the, you know, the music history of Memphis and knew a couple of the, 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 you know, newer bands coming out of there, Lucero or, uh, um, the oblivions or Amy Levere and John Polk. You know, I, I was like vaguely familiar with some of the, like the, con the contemporary things coming out of Memphis, but either way I was, I was ready to make the leap. And, Knowing that, you know, there would be like a definitely a transitional time there getting to know people. And but I was ready to do that because I was also kind of getting my solo thing. You know, I, I had been, you know, writing some songs and, and writing music and doing the multi instrumental one man band recording thing. So, you know, kind of worst case scenario, if things didn't work out sideman drummer wise, I would be able to. Uh, dive a little deeper into my own thing, you know, and the way it worked out, I was actually able to do both. You know, I, 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 sure. I really got involved with the, with the local music scene and did a bunch of great drumming gigs. Uh, a great drummer and friend of mine a guy named George Slepik is from down there and he's played with, um, all kinds of people. When, when I moved down there, he was still, George was living in LA playing with the Chris Robinson brotherhood. But George kind of, kind of put the word out for me, oh, you know, yeah. and kind of reached out to a bunch of his people that I was moving to town, and um, he he gave me a, a great like landing pad of 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 people to like go look up and you know go talk to this person and go see that person, and um, I just ran I I kind of ran with that and kind of hit the ground running once once I got there. And just dove into the, uh, it, it was exciting. Um, you know, the whole like networking thing can be, can be kind of a drag sometimes, particularly when, as we were mentioning earlier, when you're like re networking, you know, when you're going away and every once in a while you come home and you got, you know, just meeting a right. new, being involved in a new community was really like invigorating it for me. Moving to Memphis was a kind of really kind of rebirth, like, just, just personally and, and musically and, uh, Abby and I, we got married down in Memphis and, um, I was there for, probably for about six years and what, yes. Did you come across, I have a friend a drummer. There named Aaron Malasco and he's yeah. a great dude, great drummer and drum tech and drum builder. Acme. He just opened yep. a yeah, Ac tiny Acme little drum, drum. Yeah, we met down there. Shop in his house. Um, yeah, just kind. Of, you know, it's really 
small community down there. We met, he actually moved there shortly after I moved down there. And sure. we met, there's a great uh, shop down there called the, the Memphis Drum Shop. And he was working there and we had met there. And hmm. we linked up kind of recently. He was, uh, he was teching with Dispatch, Dispatch, I believe, uh, last year. I, and they passed through Atlanta, so I saw him. And um, hmm. we keep in touch. Yeah, he's a great dude. He, he's, uh, I've seen him play a couple of times. He's a great player, super cool dude. Makes great drums and, cool and is a great, uh, you know, drum like yeah. uh, w- when I was when he was still working at the Memphis drum shop, he was and I was kind of fixing up some drums at home. He was my he was my go to guy and helped me get bring bring some things back to life. How do you know, Aaron? Nice. Oh, OK. Uh, we both yeah, he's a great dude. Um, and we. Um, yeah. And he, uh, we've actually done a bunch of touring together. He he was Which one? out teching with my band. I forget that. Oh, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, loaded, he, um, was he was Duffin Ryan Cadence Adams' loaded. guy for a while. Yeah. Like right before we moved to Memphis, I, th- I was living in Nashville, and then uh, yeah. at the end, he, he finished up the Ryan Adams tour, and then and then he moved to Memphis. He's great, and Memphis was it was um, it was better. It was. It was just better than I could have imagined. You know, it was like, it was the, musically, it was, it's a much more diverse scene than I thought it would be. I was playing with an Afro pop band. I was playing with like a metal band. I was playing with a bunch of songwriters and, yeah. um, it was great. And it, there's awesome. something, there's just, a, there's like a magic in the air down there, you know, not just the music history there but just kind of the cultural history of memphis i think there's something about river town you know mississippi river towns hudson river uh city the cities um just how those how those cities developed and and uh you know similar to new orleans or st louis there's just something in the air down there uh and it's you know almost kind of tangible and um it's, it's, it's inspiring. You know, the, 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 the time that I was there, I, I just really just kind of tip of the iceberg of the, of the, of the history, you know, recent history, you know, big star stuff. And, but then, you know, the, 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 the stacks and sun and, oh. you know, all the other labels that, that came out of Memphis and then just down the road is Clarksdale. And, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty deep. It's cool. Did yeah, I, I got two. I, I got the stacks one. I got the the I got the stacks one. Thank you, and the I'm famous enough T-shirt. Ah, oh. Clear, clearly, it's I'm amazing. a big stacks. You know, I'm a stacks fan. Um, I've still never. I I know that it's not. It's great. They did a great space, job. I mean, the, I it, it's the in the same place. You know, they had leveled the they had leveled stacks, but they rebuilt it to you know the original. I guess specs you know they had the blueprint or something so it's it's a it's an exact replica uh and it's great it's right. great yeah yeah it's cool it's worth the trip oh, i mean crazy i didn't I know would, that I, I would uh particularly musician but and uh, you know I, I i i couldn't recommend memphis visits enough and and again as you know stacks sun ardent i mean there's some uh yeah and then new studios that come up, you know, the small student, Matt Ross Spang, he just opened up a new studio down there called Southern Grooves and uh, Royal, you know, Boo Mitchell, Willie Mitchell, the high rhythm section, you know, uh, Boo Mitchell still got uh, Royal Studios going and uh, it's great. Yeah. So while you were there, is did you I meet met him I, I while was you were there, or did you know him? A soul coughing fan, York? growing up, that was really kind of in my like wheelhouse. The whole in the nineties, yeah. New York, like kind of avant hip hop, groovy, like you know, uh, cool. We're, we're, I, I saw them play oh, okay, at, Mo, okay. at Mobar, yeah, in Seattle. Like six, you know. Do you remember what cap, what album they were doing on? Five fifty, six hundred cap room. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, it okay. would have been 1995. I think I saw them the Okay. I'm I saw guessing. them probably around that time too. On I I'm saw them in Irving Plaza in New York on the the their their last album El Oso. I saw them on that tour. Um, so I was a soul coughing fan, and he, when he was getting his solo thing going, he he was putting his record out on ATO, which was run by Michael McDonald, not. Do, not the doobie, but Michael McDonald, who was running ATO and was also yeah. John Mayer's manager at the time. So Mike had opened up some shows. Mike was on the road with us during the John Mayer run, opening up some shows. So I met him then. And we kind of kept in touch. We had some mutual friends and would kind of come across yeah. each other. And I'd actually auditioned when, at some point early on, I had auditioned for, you know, I, I did an audition with him, which I didn't get the gig. Um, and then we just kind of kept in touch and around, I think we moved to Memphis around the same time, actually. Uh, my friend, Mark Stepro, great drummer, is in LA, not, in LA now. He's an Ohio guy and I met him when he moved to New York and he is in LA. He's he's like, a, he's like Butch Walker's guy. You know, he does a, stuff, a bunch of stuff with Butch Walker and right now I think yeah, totally. Yeah. That's stuff with the budget stuff with Butch. He's a good and, guy to be the guy uh, for. Uh, he's like in the Wallflowers now. He's doing like the <laughs> Wallflowers gig and you know Butch stuff. And so Mark, yeah, not not too shabby, not too shabby. He's great. Mark's gig. super cool dude. Mark had <laughs> um, mentioned to me. He's like, oh, you live in Memphis now, like Mike. Do and I don't know how Mark knows Mike, but he told me that Mike Doty lives in Memphis now too. So I, I reached out to, you know, I had an older email address for Mike and reached out to him. And sure enough, he was there. And yeah, we connected down there. And that was a trip because we did, we did some things together. He, he was getting, uh, you know, we did some improv gigs together. Some of the local players, uh, we would get together and, and uh, you know, just do these, uh, just do these kind of like freaky improv gigs where sometimes he would play guitar. Sometimes he would play like a little synth box. Sometimes he would just be, you know, doing spoken word things. And that was super cool. We did a bunch of stuff together and then we did a run of shows. We did a tour together in February of 2020. That was the last, uh, the last time that was actually the last tour that I did. Um, right. Uh, you know, so far, yeah, we toured together in February of 2020. Um, and it was great. And that was, that was really fun because we opened up for ourselves as a band called the baby men. So, you know, it was the Mike Doty tour and the opening band was the baby men, which was us, but in <laughs> like fluorescent overalls and, and ski masks. And so we did a, a, a an improv gig. It was a three of it. It was me, Mike and Andrew Livingston scrap. We call them. So it was a trio so we would do an improv set and then we take a break and take our overalls off and come out as the Mike Doty band. Yeah, it was fun. That's amazing. Were he you would throw in a couple of soul coughing songs. Soul coughing material. I don't remember which ones, but it was it was it was maybe half and half of a couple of soul coughing tunes and Mike Doty tunes, but all different kind yeah, I'm sorry, I read who's, his who's book been? and I, and he's been a guest on the podcast. Oh, cool. And I know that you know that didn't, Mike. So I know that didn't end <laughs> well, and he doesn't have a lot of great feelings about that that band. And so I don't, he, you know, I don't know. He does know his, he, he does kind of different. I think depending on the kind of group that he's playing with, he'll arrange you know he'll have arrangements to suit the group that he's with. He's got a thing now called Ghost of Vroom, you know, as in yeah. Ruby Vroom, as in the first album. Oh, that's and cool. that's a very, you know, the, that's kind of like this yeah. soul. I mean, they're doing new stuff too, but that's kind of built on the soul coughing legacy, you know, doing, you know, kind of soul coughing centric things. And, but yeah, his, I've read his, his, yeah. uh, his two books and he speaks, he's a great writer too. And he speaks pretty openly about, the personalities and the experiences that went on during and after soul coughing. And 
it's kind of funny and kind of harrowing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Personalities, it's, showbiz. Yeah. What are you going to do? You know, personalities. Yeah. Friggin' musicians. Bands, really. Um, you were you stayed very productive throughout yeah. the quarantine period that we all experienced, which um, you know, a lot of people stayed productive. Some people, you know, it, it affected them. You know, it impacted their lives or their mental health in really negative ways. I I doubled down also, but um, tell me. I, you finished. I well, when I was well, I was meant to put out a, a record in in twenty in twenty eighteen, and you know I, I was also booking a bunch of I would do a bunch of solo touring of my own. You know, book a bunch of like solo acoustic tours, and so I was promoting that two thousand eighteen record, which is a full record of my own. And then I set up a home studio shortly after that, and recorded an EP called "The Songs of Shane," which was uh, covers of. Uh, songs by the pogues and then shane's band after the pogues pogues called the popes did like a five song ep and so that's when i set up my home studio was like around 2019 and so yeah so when when the when the lockdown happened i i just you know put all my energy into um recording one of the things that that was when I had my home studio set up and I was doing a, doing a bunch of solo touring by myself and spending a lot of time away from home and also spending a lot of time setting up a tour, as you know, setting up a tour is its own, you know, full-time job. And so I had this home studio tour set up, a home studio set up, and it was, it was yeah. always kind of, and that, which was also my office, which is also my office. Um, it was always kind of a bummer to like come into the home studio and to go right to the desk to be doing, you know, either setting up a tour or doing, uh, you know, advancing a tour and really kind of, you know, once I put out that first EP, just kind of like neglecting, you know, the home studio. So once the, once the, the the pandemic hit, it was like, you know, really just dove into the home recording thing and, 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 took a, you know, did some tutorials, you know, started learning more about recording and decided to mix my own stuff too. And yeah. Oh, wow. Thanks. Are you mixing your own material? um, It's, it sounds great. I'm just kind of realizing that, that you can do, or at least the, the sounds that I'm going for, I don't really need a lot of stuff. You know, the sounds either the recorded, you know, what I'm recording yeah. and also how the sounds that I like to hear when I mix. Right. Um, I can I'm, I'm at the point now that I could like do it myself, you know, down the road. You know, there's still, as you know, there's always something new to learn and some new, you know, something. It's a never ending process learning about all that stuff. But, yeah, so I'm mixing. I, I learned, you know, how to do that. And that was my goal was to uh to record to just start recording um and knowing that i would kind of mix it myself and it was it was it was just healthy you know it was it was a i i mean i'm sure it helped to keep i mean as sane as uh, as sane as i could have stay stayed during that time i think that was a big part of my just having an outlet you know having a, have a having a healthy and a productive productive outlet you know and looking back on the time uh, it's like i'm really glad that i uh that i used that time that way yeah let me ask you this Uh, i've known too many drummers that are great songwriters arrangers engineers and producers to believe that this statement is not true but i think that drummers make the the best arrangers and and producers and often engineers because capturing drum sounds is the hardest thing and they don't have to be pristine like there's a character to you can have character to drums and a character to all sound right but do you a do you believe that that could be true or is true and b 
do you think your ability to to shift from be, being in the back and being the drummer and, and sort of observing and being the person who, you know, delivers change between parts and songs, helps move the vibe. Do you think that that Definitely, yeah. came in handy sorry, when you started writing your own music? And own songs. Yeah, I think the ability to and your own and songs, to understand. Music and songs. I mean, not not just the foundations, not just the fundamentals of like intro, verse, core. You know, not just that stuff, but how to how to move those things, how to keep those things moving in in an interesting way. You know, something that's like that's engaging for. And not just for the not just for the players, but for the for the listeners. You know, I think as a drummer, you know, you're just like in tune more with with the whole with the whole unit. You know, because you're 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 driving it, but you're also you know you're right. you're supporting it, but you're you're also careful not to play on top of anybody. You know. And on top of anybody being, you know, over, not just, not just dynamically, but like your feel and being aware of, uh, just leaving, leaving room for vocals, leaving room for, for, uh, for the guitarist and not just for like a guitar solo, but for, you know, guitar leads and just, um, just being aware of how things should be like weaving and how things should be interacting and how things should kind of be coming and going and just the arrangement, just the arrangement aspect of, of, of a song. And, and. It's always been interesting to me that of anyone, I mean, it's everyone is capable in a band of, of uh committing this a this act but a drummer can just can barely yeah. change what they're doing like they could change their hi-hat pattern you know and it completely changes the vibe of a song like you could not play a yeah. drum fill between a verse and a chorus and just change your hi-hat pattern yep. and everything is suddenly different like the whole vibe. And it's true, man. And for as, I, for as, I just, I for as, as an aggressive about, instrument as it can be, you know, not always, but as it can be, it is very nuanced. You know, the smallest things can make a really big difference. And I think the same goes for recorded music, that little things go a long way, you know, uh, whatever, man. I mean, something as basic as like, you know, a tambourine on a chorus or, um, you know, like uh, how much reverb should be on something, you know, like a little too much reverb can be like way too much reverb. And, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, how things sound, you know, in terms of like, you know, putting on like your mixing hat and just being aware of like the nuances of, um, of those, of those details and, how important the old, you know, the old, the, the old thing you hear of less is more and how true that really is and being surprised all the time at how true that is. You know, most of the time when I'm recording or when I'm coming up with parts or even mixing, most of the time I'm taking things away, uh, you know, simplifying parts or, um, just making things, just making individual right. parts simpler. So the whole, so the whole, Peace can breathe. There's um, I I, I want to mention this just because you talked about levels of reverb. There's a song mm. on the 2012 St. Vincent album. Okay. I don't remember the name of it. It's still my album of the year every year. Okay. Um. Uh, it was, uh, I think, her last 4AD album. It was sort of like the the one that blew up. But there's a song where, you know, the drums are are pretty laid back. the The drums are, are crazy. I think I don't know if it's 
uh, Matt playing an electronic drum kit or if it's programmed drums, but they're, they're bananas. And, but there's, mm-hmm. there's one, just one snare hit. It might be in the whole song where it's completely flipped where the reverb just is off right on like there's a reverb on it all the other snare hits are bone yeah. dry and it has such an amazing impact yeah, it's just powerful. that one thing and, and when it's you in, know and when yeah, you leave room pretty awesome. for those kinds of things to happen be, uh, might be the opposite though you, you know you you're really going to make an impact and you know you walk that fine line of being of 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 providing like a surprise without it being distracting you know you want to like have something have enough of a surprise to like engage the listener but not so much that you throw them off of the uh off of their like listening journey you know and i feel a lot of that is a lot of that uh is part of drumming yeah. um particularly in in song in the song world you know you want to do things that 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 propel the song and i'm looking up my drums right over here off camera so i'm looking at my drums you know you want to do things that that keep the listener engaged and and keep the band engaged <laughs> for that matter without you know without throwing anybody uh without th- throwing anybody for too much too much of a loop yeah yep that taking what was over that? what was it Co- cobra is that what it was called? Oh, right, right, right. Was yeah. That, that, uh, and that, that's, uh, speaking of Cobra, that's actually similar Cobra? to the, uh, you know, uh, I don't yeah. know if it was Mike's, Mike Doty's, um, you know, kind of role model for his, but he had, a, um, uh, you know, an improv group that was similar, you know, a lot of like pointing and direction, directing and, you know, this person coming out, this person coming in. It was uh, like real time through composing. Yeah. I I love it. Yep. I love it. What do you have? Uh, you released a song today. Well, of course, we won't be talking about mm. it until people won't be hearing about it on this podcast until a few days after. But um, uh, what, what do you have recording? So I for the rest of the year? The song More that's recording? out now, it's called Five Green Queens and Jean. And I released it on St. Patrick's Day. Pogues, Irish kind of thing. And so I'm, I'm working, these songs are going towards, I'm doing uh, Songs of Shane Volume 2, which is going to be another EP that this song is going to be part of. So I recorded that here in Atlanta. Awesome. I called, I called my home studio The Wick. And when I, when I was, so my, my, my home studio in Memphis was called The Perch. It was upstairs, so I called it The Perch. <laughs> this is called The Wick. And the, the name The Wick sounded kind of familiar so I looked it up, and the Wick is the name of the house in England that recently the P. Townsend was living there for a long time, and it's you know like in England, like the or other places of the world, like houses have names, estates have names, you know. So this is called the Wick, um, and so it's also the, also the house. So before. Yeah. Pete Townsend lived there. Ronnie Wood lived there. And, you know, that Ronnie Wood album called, like, I Have My Own Album to Make or something like that. He's on the, he's in his living room, like, looking like Ronnie Wood, you know, after a party. That's yeah. in the Wick. So I felt that was pretty good, you know, that, so I'm, I stuck with the Wick, you know, if, like, Ronnie Wood, Ron Wood, I got my own album to make. Ron Wood, Pete Townsend, me. Because you have your I'll own stuff, album to I'll make. I'll hang with that, with that crowd. Um, so I recorded and mixed five yeah. queens and gene here and my friend in memphis named matt qualls he masters my stuff released that that's out now and so i'm recording four other songs and then songs of shane volume two is going to be five songs that'll be out in april end of april so yeah yeah i'm, I'm doing the last i'm mixing the last song oh. and then going Soon. back and forth with matt about the masters um and also, and then I have a bunch of you know some original song, songs I'm going to start recording after that, and then and then also doing the drummer thing here in Atlanta. Uh, we moved here 
I live in Atlanta, so you know Memphis. I was in Memphis. I'm in, in, in Atlanta now. Abby and I moved to Atlanta at the end of twenty December of twenty twenty. She got a new job and a really good opportunity. So we moved here at the end of twenty twenty, which is, I mean, probably as you know, any time to move is a crazy time. That was a crazy time to move. Just, uh, you know, it was just, it was just hectic, you know, for a lot of reasons to, to, to house hunt during that time, to move during that time and to do anything during that time in 2020 and 2021 was, was, uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of hectic, kind of stressful, you know? So we moved and we live in Atlanta now close to, uh, close to where I saw you, um, a couple months ago. And I set up a home studio here. And then, so as a drummer here in Atlanta, 2021 was, was very, very transitional, you know, because a lot of things were still shut down. And, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the great things to do when you're new to a town as a musician is to go out and see shows and to meet people and which just was not happening. So, you know, I was, I was connecting with some people online and reaching out to some people on social media and things, but it's not the same as going to see somebody or meet somebody in person. So the, a lot of that wasn't really happening until like later in 2021, but the beginning of 2022, right. things started to pick up and drum gig wise, the, the event band thing is really big in Atlanta, like you know, corporate stuff, events, weddings, parties, and so been kind of yeah. doing that stuff and church gigs are a thing in the, th- in the South, which I discovered when I moved to Memphis, I was doing some church gigs in Memphis and you know, they're like, they're gigs. You're, they're just really early on a Sunday morning, you know, in a church, and they're like, you know, the players are great and the music is, you know, um, <laughs> so uh, I've been doing some of that stuff. Yeah. Starting to kind of, you know, starting to do some original stuff with other people in town. You know, mostly it's been, it's been the, uh, you know, kind of corporate church gig stuff, which again is cool because it's, you know, it's, uh, I mean, uh, as long as you're playing sure. with people that, that, that you enjoy playing with, or as long as I'm, I'm playing with people I enjoy playing with, I mean, uh, and, and, uh, you know, there's, 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 there's the, the three elements, right? The money, the music, the hang, and you need at least two of those things and so we gotta be at least two so that's been happening and um and i haven't done this i'm doing my first solo gig a friend of mine has a band called the stoplight roses here in town and he invited me to open up a show for them at the end of april which should be cool songs of shane totally Awesome. And, which I released. I, there's a, there's a, I've been working the, the past couple of years uh, with a, a label out of Brooklyn called Declared Goods, which is a great little label. They work with a band down here called Gringo Star. What's that? Yeah, yeah, it's a great name. It's so great name. they, you know, Declared Goods have been great, and and um, great name. The uh, so yeah, I'm going to be recording. Got some more stuff to record doing some drumming gigs and um i i saw you know i got a home studio set up here for doing my own thing but also i set up and do some remote recording as i did uh recently with the with the couch wrist which was awesome thank you again for having yeah. me part of that such a great thing I, I wasn't aware of it until you had asked me and i dove in and it's such thank a you. Uh, you had an amazing catalog there it's it's uh it's pretty deep Like I said, I du- well, thank okay. you. I doubled down during the quarantine stuff, you know, and, and you know, I'm up here now. I'm like two and a half was that, three hours. So you from had couch so, you know, couch was was you happening pre COVID. Make my own fun. I did. I had We're I had it when I was in Brooklyn. It's called couch riffs because it used to okay. happen on my couch in my Brooklyn apartment, and then. Are you like, bo- you know, are you uh, going Carol back Gardens. and where's, where's, yeah. where's your home base now? Are you up? Okay. And was that a COVID thing? I'm was here. that like a flea? I'm just, I'm here. This is, this is where I'm at. No, no, yeah. we, we bought a house up here before COVID. It's like the one <laughs> amazing decision that I've 
been involved in in my life. You know, bought a house when it was affordable before it exploded at just the right time. Like, you know, we had a, a little over a year to sort of get settled in and so that we weren't blindsided when we were quarantined, but I I'll bet. tell you that whole story another time. It was um, a wild. So yes, yeah, so doing you know all that all that stuff. The doing uh, COVID days. Do my so. stuff, drum gigs, and um, you know mowing the lawn every couple of weeks, and sure. Do you have any interest in going out on the road and playing with? people or do you is it is going away for no i would i would um uh, my my head hasn't really been there you know my my head kind of came out of that space in you know in 2020 and hasn't really been back there but i'm not i'm certainly not opposed to it uh you know i haven't i I would i love it i love touring um i like to travel i love taking pictures i love exploring different places and playing every night is great and you know bonus when you're doing it with music that you like with people that you like and um no i just i just i just haven't you know uh it hasn't come up i haven't been in uh, again i think a lot of it is headspace you know i haven't really put myself out there in that way um but I'm I'm definitely uh, interested in doing you know getting back on that uh, getting back on that horse. How about you? Do you have do you have some stuff less that when I when I saw you and for the first? Yeah, me too. Oh, you're gonna be there here. Me too. I'll be in Atlanta oh, in who? June. I'd love to see you. Sweet. I'll be in oh, Atlanta. Oh yeah, you know what? Yeah. Were you? Are, are you? Well, I'll be playing with an Ugly original Kid Joe. UKJ. Okay. Were you guys playing? No. Okay. I'll look it up. I'll look no. it up. I'm not in a... Sweet. Oh, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah. Um, well, listen, we, um, we, I, we've been having Holy such smokes. a good time talking and I've been, I've been enjoying myself so much. We're like we, 20 minutes over. Are we like 20 minutes? And are we 20 minutes over 60 noticed. minutes, 20 minutes over 90 um, minutes? You're a great hang, and a- holy any- smokes, where's it go? We're almost at two hours right now. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. I think uh, you know you're the you're the kind of player that any any band will be will be happy and lucky to to have you along. Um, you're you're a great hang. You're smart. You're a great player, and. Um, well, that's and, I, and gosh good enough darn for me. People like you. <laughs> I like you. Thanks for having me. It was great. I'm glad it worked out. Thank you so much and for giving I'm me glad, um, so so much time tonight. I'm just glad to be here. Yeah, man. Oh, that's my line. That's my line. Every 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 night before we went on stage with Hooky. Uh, I'd everyone are just they, you know they're just like, they've been on, playing guys. together for so long they're just sort of like <laughs> sitting on the side of the stage and I would I would go hug everyone and be like hey <laughs> hey I give everyone a hug I'm really really happy only, to be really yank and on then the they were just like oh fucking Americans man these fucking wow. Americans <laughs> a lot of tea yeah, a lot of tea I was. band and crew tea no coffee a, all a bunch of mangs okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you, man. No, I don't drink tea. Yeah, I don't do it. Yeah. I'm going to kill it. Thank you.